It is really a, a great honor to be here. Um, I have had this on my calendar for several months. I actually have a unique job. I travel all over the country speaking at churches that have relationship with Gateway. And uh, I know you're not supposed to have favorites, right? <laughs> with churches and with pastors. But I think we all just have to acknowledge from time to time we break those rules. And I love Pastor Eben. I consider him not to just be a great pastor and leader, but a dear friend. And we hold one another accountable. He encourages me. There have been a number of times that I was walking through some challenges, and I needed a voice outside of the large, giant, gateway world to encourage me and to help me and to give me perspective. And on my short list of calls is Pastor Evan Connor. You guys are blessed. Please don't ever take for granted that this is normal. I'm just telling you, the worship we just encountered, unbelievable. I think I need to be here more often. Yeah. This is wonderful. Well, listen, it is a great, great joy to be here. By the way, I, I just have to say, if you like my shirt, thank your pastor. He may be one of the most generous men I know. And uh, several years ago, uh, when I first met him, it was 10 years ago, he called and was wanting to know the keys to our growth. And I had the privilege of having uh, a meal with him. Here's what I remember about our conversation. Uh, he bought my meal. And before I left the, the booth there at the restaurant, he handed me a card. And inside the card was a, a gift to my favorite men's clothing store. And, uh, and that was 10 years ago. Three years ago, he and I went to St. Louis to do some ministry together. And at the airport, we walked into a men's uh, shop. And I just said, wow, that's a great looking shirt. A week later, it's in my house. And so I'm wearing it today. Don't you love your pastor? He's got generosity all over him. There are many, many great stories I could tell about Pastor Evan. But they invited me here to minister. So if you have your Bible... I want to encourage you to open your Bible to uh, a couple of passages. The primary text is going to be Isaiah 61. And then if you would, put a marker at Jeremiah chapter 29. So Isaiah 61, Jeremiah 29. And while you're marking those passages, I want to bring your greetings uh, from Pastor Robert Morris and the leadership team at Gateway. We truly love your church. We truly love your leadership. And again, as I've already said, these are some of Bethany and mine's choicest friends. Well, after 33 years in vocational ministry, I've discovered something that troubles me. Some of the saddest, most depressed, and most uh, unfulfilled people on earth are Christians. And these are people who regularly attend church. They read their Bibles and pray. Many of them tithe. They know all the disciplines of the Christian faith. But if you examine their lives closely, you might discover that the great majority of them are miserable. They're not living the joy-filled, abundant life that was promised to us by Jesus there in John 10 uh, verse 10. And so uh, as a result of their misery, they have very little, if any, positive influence on their uh, non-Christian friends, neighbors, co-workers, and family members. Now, aren't you glad Mr. Encouragement came to speak to you this morning? <laughs> Now, I'm telling you the truth, so what I'd like to ask you to do is to really tune in. And for the next 35 minutes, I want you to give me your undivided attention. And here's why. It could be that the person I just described is seated immediately in front of you. And he or she needs to hear this message. That person could be right behind you. He or she could be to your right or to your left. There's a possibility that the person I'm describing this morning rode in the car with you on the way to the service today. And there is a slight chance that I just described the person that is seated in your chair. And if that is true, this message could truly be life-changing. And I want to ask you to tune in uh, and give me your undivided attention. Here's what I want to do. I want to ask and answer an important question. And here's the question, why? Why are there so many uh, unhappy and unfulfilled Christians attending 
our churches today. Now, truthfully, there are several reasons. We're going to focus on one reason, the primary reason. And if you're a note taker, just go ahead and jot the reason down from the get-go, and then we'll develop it as we go. And here's the reason. The church has only emphasized one of the ministries of Jesus. The church has only emphasized one of the ministries of Jesus. In other words, he came to do many things to help us. The church has only emphasized one. So in just a minute, we're going to look at Isaiah 61. And when we get there, we'll see this is an amazing prophetic picture Uh, A snapshot, if you will, of the soon-to-come ministries of Jesus. But before we get there, I want to highlight one other verse, and you'll see why, because it ties in so beautifully. It is in John chapter 17. Now, homework for this week. Probably the most beautiful prayer ever prayed in the Bible is prayed in John chapter 17. Theologians refer to this passage as the high priestly prayer of Jesus. And in this familiar prayer, in the last hours of Jesus' life, uh, he, he prayed for himself, he prayed for the disciples, and listen, he prayed for the church. Can I just say, be like Jesus. I'm telling you, it is a good thing for you to pray for yourself. It is a good thing for you to pray for the others who are part of uh, of, uh, the church who are following Jesus. And it is a great thing for you to regularly pray for the church at large. Be like Jesus. This prayer, we're going to look at one verse from this prayer. It follows what we uh, refer to as the Last Supper, the, the, the meal that Jesus had with his disciples in the last hours of his life in the upper room. And it comes right before he journeyed into the Garden of Gethsemane. It's recorded in John 18, where if you recall, he grieved so deeply in his prayer that he actually sweat drops of blood. The sweating of blood uh, actually is recorded in Luke 22, but it's the same story. And, and he did all of this while his disciples fell asleep. Now, uh, how did that prayer begin? John chapter 17, verse 4. Listen, Father, he said, I have brought you glory here on earth By completing the work you gave me to do. Oh, church, I have to ask, how many here at Word of Truth want to bring glory to God with your life? Is there anybody here that wants to glorify God with your life? Listen, if so, I'm going to show you the key. It is by completing the work you've been given to do. In other words, in the same way that Jesus had a job description, Isaiah 61, we'll see it together, every person here has an assignment on his or her life. I'm telling you, there are gifts and abilities that God has wonderfully placed in your life, and they need to be fully expressed, but it would be impossible absolutely undoable for you to fulfill your assignment to bring glory to God unless you understand and apply all of the ministries of Jesus to your life. So now we're ready. Look with me. Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2. Uh, and, and, And this is, for all intents, Jesus's job description. Now, the prophet Isaiah, some 700 years in advance of the birth of Christ, he prophesied uh, this, this wonderful Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me is the way this begins. Can I just recommend that, that you live under the influence of the Holy Spirit? Amen. Yeah, so Isaiah says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. He has chosen me to preach the gospel to the poor to heal the brokenhearted, to minister recovery of sight to the blind, to preach freedom to the captives, to set at liberty those who are bruised, and finally to declare or proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, we're going to walk through each of these six items on Jesus' job description, and here's your part. Just simply ask yourself as we look at each one, have I applied that ministry of Jesus to my life? And if not, today would be the perfect day to do so. So here's item number one. Jesus came to preach the gospel 
to the poor. Now, th- th- there's a danger that we would focus just on that final prepositional phrase, to the poor. Let me make a couple of uh, uh, just comments about that. Uh, Can we agree it doesn't matter how much money you have in your wallet or in your purse, in your bank account, or even in a retirement account somewhere. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, you, my friends, are poor. So this applies to all of us, right? So we need a relationship with the Son of God. So back to the item. It says Jesus came to preach the gospel. Preaching the gospel leads to the first ministry of Jesus, salvation. In my uh, uh, belief, this is the one ministry of Jesus that the church at large gets right. This is the one that we do well, preaching the gospel, declaring. Listen, Jesus is not one of the ways. He is the only way Uh, to God. He is the only way we can have relationship with the Father. So salvation is the greatest miracle anyone here or even outside this room will ever experience. You see, a person could be physically healed and still die and spend eternity separated from God in hell. No, the Bible says that uh, it's clear that if you want to go to heaven, you must be born again. So salvation, we would all agree, it is wonderful, it is necessary, it is essential, it's extremely important. But can we also agree that not, uh, let's see, salvation alone won't solve all the problems that we're going to face this side of heaven. And so Jesus wants to make available more to us. When we only emphasize salvation, we cheapen the death of Christ. Because he died to make more available to us. He wants to help us uh, this side of heaven, not just get us to heaven. So what are some of the other ways in addition to salvation that uh, Jesus wants to help us? Here's number two. Jesus came to heal the broken hearted. Now, let me personalize this for us. Has anyone here other than the speaker ever had a broken heart? Is it possible that some of you came to church today with a broken heart? Listen, if so, don't be discouraged. Be in Encouraged. According to Psalm 34, verse 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and it says, He saves those who are crushed in spirit. If, if your spirit is crushed today, if your heart is broken, the Lord is near. He is here with us. I believe the greatest need in the church today is for God to heal the hearts of those who already have a relationship with Him. If that describes you today, please know, emotional healing, inner healing is available. And all you need to do is pray and receive that great gift from the Lord. Here's the third item on Jesus' amazing job description. He came to minister recovery of sight to the blind. This is a clear reference to physical healing. Listen, I am absolutely puzzled by the bad theology that exists in the great majority of churches all across the land that would suggest that physical healing as well as the other power gifts of the Holy Spirit ceased and are no longer needed because the church has been fully established uh, at the end of the first century. Uh, Can I just give you a Greek word for that? Hogwash. You see, (laughs) truthfully, uh, it is not biblical to think that way. There's nothing in the scripture, nor is there in history that would support that. Here's the good news. God can heal you. No matter what the doctor's report is, we need to understand that physical healing is still available to us today. Psalm 103 verses 2 and 3. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Can I suggest to you, we're prone to forget. And God's saying, don't forget. He he does what? He forgives all our sin. There's the first ministry of Jesus. Anybody here thankful for your salvation? See, but it continues. It doesn't end there. It says, he heals all our diseases. Physical healing is for today. 
And so listen to me. If you need physical healing today, be confident that God has purchased your healing at Calvary uh, by Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead. Uh, He is a victor over physical sickness in your body. Great news. God is not in heaven this morning nervous. He's not overwhelmed. He's not wiping his brow, sweating profusely, uh, concerned that I need to hurry along because I'm overemphasizing something he might be able to do. No, listen, God has it all under control. So we're continuing down this great checklist. Item number four, Jesus came to preach freedom to the captives. Freedom from bondage, freedom from addiction, from unhealthy life pattern. And so it could be that there are folks here in the house today who are in bondage to many things. It could be even one of the the, the taboo sins of our culture. When we think of those uh, uh, things like alcoholism, drug addiction, more recently and very prominently today, pornography. Can I just tell you, uh, all of these are common both inside and outside the church. In men and in women, both young and old. Listen, if that's you, there's help today. I'm telling you, freedom in Christ is available. And we want to pray for you and ask the Lord to give you breakthrough where you've been in bondage for however long it is that you've been trapped. Uh, Maybe you'd say, Ed, I'm doing well there, but I seem to struggle with insecurity. I seem to struggle with finding my identity in my performance. Oh, listen, Uh, some of us often think um, God's love is conditional. Can I just remind you, his love is unconditional. It is not based on your performance. If I'm having a good day or a bad day as a husband, father, pastor, leader, whatever it might be, or you as as a mom, as a wife, as an employee, whatever your role might be, listen, God's love is unconditional. You don't have to perform for him. We need to find our identity in Christ alone and believe once and for all that he truly loves us and he accepts us in our current condition and he wants to help us move forward. Listen, I'm so encouraged by a a number of wonderful encounters that I've had with God through the years. I am so grateful for my salvation. It was uh, age 21, 1982. I was a confused college student who was stacking a number of bad decisions. I have no doubt in my mind that no guest speaker at Word of Truth has ever been arrested as many times as I have. I'm just telling you. And if that makes you uncomfortable, maybe this news will help. I've only been arrested one time since I've been in vocational ministry. Does that help you? Yeah. I'm saying God has done a great work in my life. Thank God for my salvation. And I'm also thankful. Let's just thank the Lord, right? Another great encounter that I had with God was my baptism with the Holy Spirit, and that was, I was 29 years old, had been married just a few years, and I knew at that point, I really need the Holy Spirit. That was back in 1990. And I journeyed on through life, continued in ministry, without question, uh, the greatest behavioral change to ever take place in my life took place in 2004. I was 43 years old, and this is the encounter with God that makes my family most grateful. I I was an absolute disaster. There was a hidden, dark sin in my life while serving on staff at one of the largest and most influential churches in our nation at Gateway. And I'm so thankful for the healthy environment there that allowed me to get the help that I needed. You see, I got crossed up with my boss. Can I just tell you, that's not recommended. And, uh, and, and, and I asked him twice, please don't ever say that to me again. Well, he was picking, and it was very personal to me, and I lost my mind. So something happened that I'd been able for years to keep hidden. And, and I lived with raging, maniacal, hide-the-women-and-the-children type of anger. And, and, and I suffered greatly with what I call little man syndrome. Yeah. So I lost my mind. And before I knew what was happening, that all too familiar adrenaline rush 
veins popping out in my neck, heavy breathing. Uh, I'm telling you, anger overwhelmed me. And I reached across my boss's desk, pulled him uh, through the top of his desk, pens and pencils went everywhere, his coffee spilled, his eyes were big like saucers. And rather, rather than give me what I deserved, I had earned firing. Rather than take me to HR to, to lose my job, he held me, he prayed for me, and he said, I want to get you some help. Now, at this point, thank the Lord for that, amen? And again, this only 12 years ago, but he took me to HR and, we, yeah, he drew up a, a plan to get me help with a licensed professional counselor, and no longer was this a suggestion. This was a requirement. Can I tell you, there may be some of you that need to be required to take steps. And so the Lord was so good to me. I met with a counselor, and for the first time in my life, I told someone about what took place in my life as a little boy in a children's home between the ages of five and eight. I had been repeatedly sexually abused. Now, I don't tell you that to make you sad. I'm in a great place in life today. But I had been violated again and again. And when I went for help in the children's home, I was told to go to my room and to never mention it again. And my only response was to become a fighter. And, and I lived uh, believing a lie that I would always be angry. I'm telling you, this made me this mad. Little things caused me to respond in a, in a raging maniac type of way. But through the ministry of this uh, wonderfully gifted counselor and the Holy Spirit uh, doing a work in my heart, I experienced inner healing that led to freedom from raging anger. Can I tell you, I'm not the same man. My wife has a new husband. My boys have a new father. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. So we have salvation. We have this wonderful uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. But much later, this inner healing and freedom that was produced in my life. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. Listen, if you need freedom in your life today, we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to do His work in you as He has done in me. Does the Holy Spirit govern, control, and influence your life? I believe we're all pre-wired with the Holy Spirit when we're born again. And in the same way, this beautiful auditorium was pre-wired with lighting. Someone had to come in early this morning and flip the switch to activate, to turn the lights on. I believe the Holy Spirit is resident in your life if you know Jesus, but it could be that today you just simply need to flip the switch, and the Holy Spirit could produce in you freedom over whatever it is that you've believed a lie would always exist in your world. John eight thirty six reminds us, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Another translation or paraphrase says this, if the Son, Jesus, liberates you, then you are completely, you are unquestionably free. So we're motoring through this wonderful job description. Item number five, Jesus came to set at liberty those who are bruised. This is a second reference to inner healing or emotional healing. Now, tucked away in the proverb, Proverb 20, verse 30, in the King James, it reads a little awkward. It says, the blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil, and so do stripes the inward parts of the belly. Now, that is a peculiar verse. But in a more modern paraphrase, that same verse in today's English version makes lots of sense. And here's what it says, sometimes... It takes a painful experience, a difficult experience to make us change our ways. Now, that works, doesn't it? Let me ask you, how many times do you need to touch the top of a hot stove to know, I don't ever want to do that again? See, I, I learned the first time. Yeah. Are you learning from your painful experiences in life? Uh, some 13, almost 14 years ago, spring of 2003, we relocated from Houston to the Dallas area to accept a position at Gateway. And our younger son, Levi, who was five at the time, um, 
uh, cried out uh, one evening, just a few weeks after we arrived, in the middle of the night. It was about 2 a.m., and I was startled awake by a noise that let me know something had happened, and it sounded like he had fallen and really hurt himself. And as I'm uh, awakened with this uh, shrill cry, I'm reminded we just assembled bunk beds in his room. So without thinking about the appropriate uh, way to approach this, I'm on my feet running pitch black of, uh, of, of night, unfamiliar with the lay of the furniture in our new home. And as I ran toward the stairs trying to be a good father, I caught my thigh on the corner of a piano bench that had been left turned out. And, and if you're curious, I knew instantly that's going to leave a mark. And, and I did not quote uh, my favorite scripture, and I certainly did not say, <laughs> praise the Lord. It just, it was nowhere to be found. Well, I was hobbling upstairs, injured, to check on Levi, and here's what I discovered. Levi was fine. He would soon be back in the bottom bunk and fast asleep, but dear old dad had an injury. I really appreciate your sympathy. Uh, Pastor, <laughs> sorry, it might be good to offer a class on empathy and compassion uh, to this crew. Well, uh, the next morning, I actually led a men's small group, and as I uh, went into the men's small group, I began to tell them about the encounter in the middle of the night, and that's why I was limping, and, and I remember none of them had any sympathy for my, uh, uh, my situation, but all of them, for whatever reason, unsolicited, they had advice. They gave me advice, input like, uh, slow down, life's not an emergency, hey, don't run in the dark, duh, these are all very helpful, but again, can I just give you a tip, if someone doesn't ask your opinion, they likely don't want it. I'm just telling you, I didn't really want a lot of input. There was one bit of advice that I got that I have lived by since. It was very helpful. And here's what the older man in the group told me. He said, Ed, why don't you stay in bed and let your wife take care of those boys? That's some pretty good advice. A few men like that, not all the ladies here, right? Well, I don't, I don't care who you are. That's a funny story. And it's funny because it didn't happen to you, right? But, but not all painful encounters in life make us laugh. And some of you came to church today experiencing intense emotional pain. There are others right here in the room with us who are living with ongoing, chronic, physical pain. Many here have been abandoned, others abused. Some have been neglected, others rejected. And if any of these are your experience, can I suggest you likely have bruises in your life. A bruise is an outward sign. It's an indicator that something inside has been wounded. Listen, you may have been betrayed by an unfaithful spouse. It could be that you've had your heart broken by a wayward child. You may have been fired unjustly by a boss. It could be that you were humiliated and embarrassed by a coach when you failed to execute a play and it cost your team an important game. It may be that over the years you've looked up to a pastor or a spiritual leader. You honored them only later to discover that person was living a double life. He or she wasn't practicing what they were preaching. And as a result, to this day, you have an eyebrow raised. You're not confident in trusting spiritual leaders. If any of those or anything similar are your experience, it's likely that you have bruises. And so don't miss this fifth item on Jesus' job description. He came to set at liberty those who are bruised. So catch this. Life's most painful experiences can be great teachers. That is, if we choose to learn. And so I have to ask, before we look at the final item, are you choosing to learn and are you choosing to grow uh, as a result of the pain uh, that you're experiencing in your life? So thus far, we've seen that Jesus came to save us. He came to heal us emotionally and physically. He came to set us free of bondages and addictions. But listen, there's one more item I don't want you to miss, and here it is. Jesus came to proclaim, to declare the year of the Lord's favor. So how many of you could stand to get a little more of God's favor on your life? Anybody here? Yeah. How many of you would not mind if this very morning God extended his encouragement and hope your way? Listen, uh, 
I'm convinced that one of the greatest strategies of the enemy is to steal our hope. There's nothing as a pastor more difficult to see on another person than hopelessness. Hopelessness can be brought on by a negative medical report. We saw the little video earlier, right? When the doctor gives that, that unwanted news. It could be a, a crisis in your marriage or a crisis in your family. It could be an unexpected career change. Suddenly, a job you thought would be there for many years to come is no longer available to you. Listen, if, if you've encountered anything like that, there's a story in the Bible I just want to point out. It, it is a story where there was hopelessness, but God prevailed. In Acts chapter 27, we, we see the great story of Paul's uh, shipwreck. This is when he and 275 other men are, are out journeying on, a, on a, a, a stormy sea. And they didn't have the modern navigational tools that we do today. And, and the further they, they navigated, they moved right deeper into the storm for a period of a couple of weeks. The ship was being battered and destroyed. And they all, according to the word here, they feared for their lives. But Paul had gotten a word from God. He knew that he would one day preach in Rome and he had yet to get there. So by faith, he instructed everyone go into the underbelly of this ship and begin to discard the things that are unnecessary. Can I suggest to you, if this verse, listen to the verse, uh, I, uh, this is uh, Acts twenty seven twenty. when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, does that describe your life today? It says, and the storm continued raging, finally we gave up all hope. Listen, church, when we give up all hope, the enemy wins. Let's not let him win. And so Paul instructed, discard the things that are hindering the ship from making progress through the storm. Could it be that there are things in your life that need to be thrown overboard? There are things you need to get out of your life. And instead of just crying out harder to God, participate with God by taking some good steps. Do some things that will free your life to move forward so that you can get to your place of destiny. Good news, that ship was destroyed, but everyone on board made it to the shore. Listen, God wants you to know today, you're going to get through this storm. If you're walking through a hard time, you by faith believe, lean in, get rid of the things that are hindering you and move forward in God. Now, I want to contrast that, that difficult verse with one of the most positive verses in the Bible. I'd ask you when we began to put a marker at Jeremiah 29. Look with me at verse 11. This is an incredible scripture, and it could be describing your future. God says here, I know the plans I have for you. Ponder that thought. God has a plan for your life. Plans to do what? To prosper you, not to harm you. And then ultimately, plans to give you hope and a future. It is the will of God for you to live in hope. I'm telling you, we need to be full of hope. Our, our future is bright in God. Now, as we move to ministry time, I want to pray a closing prayer. We've already had an altar ministry time after a wonderful time of worship. I want to ask you to do this. Would you stand with me? And I want to ask you to consider a question, and then I'm going to pray uh, over all of us, and we'll be done. Stand with me. And here's the question I want you to consider in response to the message today. And it's simple, really. Which ministry of Jesus do I need to apply to my life today? Which ministry of Jesus do I need to apply to my life today? Let me ask you to do one other thing now. Please just close your eyes. We're going to have a, a, a couple of minutes here just to minister a uh, closure to the sermon today. So don't be looking around. This isn't for your neighbor. This could be a message God has for you today. So I want you to consider that question, which ministry to apply to your life. And then I'll remind you and I'll pray over us and we'll be done. Do you need today to be born again, to receive Christ, to be forgiven of your sins? Are you today in need of salvation? Do you need a prayer for a broken heart? Maybe it's prayer for physical healing in your body. Are you someone who would say, Ed, much like you struggled with anger, I've believed a lie that I'll always struggle with, whatever the 
issue may be. And today, what you really need is freedom. You need breakthrough. You need freedom from bondage, addiction, unhealthy life pattern. Listen, God wants to help with that today. It could be that you'd say, Ed, I need God to heal the bruises in my life. I'm literally walking through life with a limp because of the pain that I carry. And it may be that you would just say, man, the one that stands out to me, I need God's favor. I need the hope of God to be brought to my life today, to my marriage, to my family, to my finances, to my career. Now, I'm going to just simply pray. If you would would just say, Ed, um, while you pray, I want you to include me. I need to apply at least one of those to my life. Would you just lift a hand this morning? Oh, good. Can I give you good news? You're in good company. Almost everyone here has a hand lifted. So let's just lift both hands and let's pray and receive from the Lord. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for all that you've done in each of our lives, for our salvation, Lord, for the various uh, encounters we've had with you. But Lord, we're in need today. And so I want to pray for this wonderful uh, group of people here at Word of Truth Family Church. Lord, we first, I just pray blessing on my dear friends, Pastors Evan and Pastor Sarah and Heaven and Landon, Lord, that wonderful Connor family. Bless them, oh God. Thank you for them. Lord, thank you for the leadership team here, Pastor Che and the worship leaders and all the staff. Lord, we pray blessing on the leadership team here at Word of Truth. And God, I pray that by example, Lord, they would apply everything that is on this wonderful list to their lives so that we could then impart it to others. And Father, I pray for those who are here this morning in need. Lord, for those that need to be born again, we today, we receive salvation, Lord. We believe that that it is Jesus alone who brings right relationship with God. And Father, we confess sin and we ask you to save us and to cleanse us, Lord, from unrighteousness. May people be born again today and receive salvation. And Lord, others, there are many, many here who identified with the broken heart. Father, I pray for those who are here today and their hearts are broken, Lord. They are, they are crushed in spirit. Lord, would you heal broken hearts? Would you minister? Sometimes our circumstances don't immediately change, but Lord, by faith, we just say we want to be healed. Lord, we want emotional healing for our lives, healing of broken hearts, healing of crushed spirits. Lord, healing of the bruises that are a part of the pain of life. Father, we also pray for those who are in bondage, those who are in uh, addictive patterns, Lord, those who have unhealthy life patterns. I've been so vulnerable, Lord, in telling them about my own issues with anger. But, Lord, I thank you. I celebrate today that I'm free of anger, Lord. I don't live there anymore. And, Lord, by testimony, I just declare over everyone here that he or she can be free. Men and women, old and young, boys and girls, Lord, we don't have to live in bondage. And so we pray right now for freedom to come. And if you're here and you're saying, I really identify with this word, I'm not sure what to do. Just identify the specific thing that has come to mind where you may have believed that lie that you'll always struggle with this issue. And we're just going to break that right now in the name of Jesus. And we apply healing there and freedom uh, from Christ in the name of Jesus. Now listen, there's one other thing. If you need hope or favor, let's just agree right now. Father, we pray that you would open heaven and you would just pour out your favor. Lord, we pray for for favor to come. Lord, we pray for hope to come in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask that, that you would help us to experience everything that you want to make available to us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Can we thank the Lord for what he's doing? Thank you.